I said, all the bully wants is some more alternatives to just fight or flight. It wants to learn to do other things to get out of this conflict. Hello there, everyone. It's episode 53 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Dr. Terrence Webster Doyle. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but listeners know me better as the host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you didn't know, makes the world's best sparring gear as well as great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we offer, like our zip-up hooded sweatshirts. They're comfortable, they incorporate our really popular vintage-styled graphics, and they just look sharp. They're available in two colors, and they've been a big hit ever since we introduced them a couple months ago. Lots of pictures of these and all of our other great stuff are at whistlekick.com. If you want to check out our other podcast episodes or the show notes, those are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website... Go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer great content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Now let's move on to the episode. On episode 53, we get to talk to Dr. Terrence Webster Doyle, who asked that I call him Dr. T. Dr. T is a noted authority on the subject of bullying and uses his more than 50 years of martial arts experience to bring context to bullying and other conflict situations. He's written extensively on the subject for over 30 years, and he brings that knowledge with him to our conversation today. I enjoyed talking with him, and I hope you learn as much from today's episode as I did. Dr. T, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I really appreciate it, Jeremy. I've been looking forward to this. I really like to say some things. Hopefully that will stimulate people to look into martial arts more deeply. Let's put it that way. Fantastic. What what better goal could we have to come out of an episode than to have people look at what we do and what we love so much with depth? But... Let's get started the way we always get started. Tell everybody who you are, how you got started, and and that early part of your journey, your origin story. Okay. Well, as a child in the 1950s, I'm up there in age, so in the 1950s, I was bullied terribly. I, my teeth were knocked out. I got a head injury that it was very serious. The doctor at the emergency ward said, son, if this was another half inch over, you'd be dead. Nice thing to tell a 10-year-old kid. But anyhow, I've been bullying this guy kept going. He wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop. And so what I wanted to do was to be able to, you know, get out of being bullied and not get this continual thing. Like, and then I moved to the next town, and the next town was a rather wealthy town. We weren't wealthy. Uh, my father was a school teacher and so on. And the next town bullied me even worse, or more emotionally. You're the kid from the other town, you know, and uh, you, you're not a part of our little group, you know, kind of our little, you know, our little tribe that they have, this little rich yeah. tribe. So... That was more emotional. That was like, you're not a part of our group. And just as a little aside, what I did, I was so furious at being bullied in the other town physically that what I did is when, the, when I walked into the school, the first day, the new school in the other town, what happened was the, the, the head guy in the school and his buddies behind him walked up to me, came out of the whole bullying thing, and he grabbed me in a headlock. I was so furious, I picked him up by his belt and his shirt, and lifted him up over my head, and believe it, and I was big, <laughs> right up over my head. I put him down, and I said, don't you ever, ever do that. And we've been friends for over 50 years. He's a very fine fellow now, but really? that was a good thing for me to do at that point. That's what I need to do. But that bullying stimulated me not only to go to the martial arts and get involved in that, but to continue, continue to find what's going on with this bullying. Yeah, and certainly uh, an important topic, and we didn't reach out to you for this reason, but I think it's very appropriate time-wise to have you on, and I'm looking forward to learning more about this, co- you know, the the issue and and what you're offering to help people out with it. You know, I, I think it's something that, as martial artists, there's a lot that we can do, not just within our own community, but within the wider yes. global community. So, you went to train in the martial arts to help you with being bullied. So what what kind of training did you start with? Well, you know, I'm 75 years old, believe it or not, and I've been in martial arts for 54 years. I started in 1961 in Florida, in University of Miami, where I was going there as a student. And I was walking down, it was called Miracle Mile there, 
And there was this little storefront, and I saw these people that looked like pajamas, these white pajamas jumping around. I said, what in the heck is that? So I, 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 got, I was intrigued by it because I've been bullied. I wanted to do something. I could, so I walked in. I, found, I don't even remember the style. I remember the man was Philippine, and I don't really, I just know it was very close to Japanese style, very, you know, practice Japanese style. After that, I knew that. So I just was intrigued. I said, I've got to do this. There's something about this. And I did. And I started practicing there. And I kept going, going and going and going. And I said, the, the major part of my studying was in New York City, in McBurney's YMCA, in Genseiru Karate, with my instructor, Shigeru Namano Sensei. So that was where I started. And I just, it just, caught on to me. I couldn't let go. I just got kept going. And not just not just for me being bullied because, you know, physically, but I think there was more behind it. It just, you know, just kept at me. And so I said, I want to help kids. I've got to help kids. And so that's what I started to do later on. Maybe we can talk about going through this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there will be things that thread through this episode episode, every episode we've had in the past, and I think anybody that listens to the show consistently knows that while the show is varied, the people that come on are just as varied, but at the same time, we have things that are really important to us, and they thread through our lives, and they can't help but come out yeah. as we talk, and I think that's fantastic. Good. It's part of the beauty of the show. So, it sounds like, even from an, from an early age, long before Bullying was something that was discussed openly and publicly as a problem. It was important to you. Yes, it was. Well, in those days, um, two things: boys, boys will be boys, and everybody figured that's what happens. You just fight. But it was very strange. In those days, you never could kick somebody. If you kick somebody, everybody would boo you. If you want to stand up, box style punch, and everything else, wrestle, whatever, but no kicking. So yes, that was interesting for me at that point, and. Um, that later on to have all of these other parts, the physical parts of the martial arts come in was with a rather interesting too. And then I had to deal with that. Did did you ever defend yourself and have to have an internal debate? Do I use my feet or not? <laughs> very good. <laughs> that, was the, well, that was the first thing I thought of when you said that. <laughs> very good. No, I, you know, actually I developed over the years a way to deal with the bullies, the people who came after me, without using anything physical. I, I just, I've just figured it out, you know, and that, that I, that I've written let me books about that. How to use my mental martial arts, as I call them. How to, you know, I call it the twelve ways to walk with confidence. How, very, very many things you can do to deal with the bully. You can talk to the bully. You can make friends with the bully. You can call a proper authority. You can trick the bully into, you know, with creative type of distractions and so on. So I, I use those just because I didn't want to hit somebody. I just just didn't want to. And so I never did. All these years, I've never physically got, although I've been uh, accosted and attacked, uh, not physically attacked, because I'm, I'm pretty big. I'm six foot three, 260 pounds. I was pretty big all my life. Most people, except, strange enough, for the smaller guys, who just was kind of like very primitive. They wanted to get the big guy, you know. But most of the time, I could handle it. So that was that's what I thought would work, and it did work, and that's what I wanted to teach the kids. Excellent. You, you're about as far ahead of a curve as I think anyone really could be on. Uh-huh. The subject. That's that's really great. So that gives us some good context for who you are and the other things that we're going to talk about through the rest of the episode. But of course, as I already said, and as anybody who listens knows, it's all about the stories for us. And you gave us some hints of some stories. I'm sure you've got a ton of great ones. But I'd like you to pick out one that you'd like to share with us, with your best martial arts story. Well, that's a good one to think about what the best is. I think that when I met, okay, what happened was, I remember Bruce Lee, obviously, and I read his book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, and it was very interesting, the first part of it, about conditioning, you know, what's behind the fist, you know, that mental conditioning and so on. So, and I remember that Brandon died, obviously, I remember that, and I wrote his mother and Bruce's widow or wife, Linda, now that she remarried a man named Bruce Cadwell, another Bruce, believe it or not. So she's Linda Lee Cadwell. Anyhow, I wrote her and said how sorry I was about, you know, Brandon and Bruce. 
And we started to become pen pals, writing back and forth, back and forth. Very educated woman, very fine woman. And we happened to be in Arizona at the time, and she happened to be in Arizona. So we met. And my wife is rather forward. She said, well, let's, we're going to come up and visit you. I'm like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> she lived up in uh, Idaho. I said, well, okay. And, and Linda said, no, fine. I want you to come up. I said, well, wow, this is great. So we came up, and we visited Linda, and I stayed in Brandon's room, which was, and, which was really something. It was very heartfelt. And then uh, Linda showed us all of Bruce's paraphernalia and the things he'd saved up over the years. And Linda and I had a very, we had a good talk, my wife and Linda and I and her husband, Bruce, about the martial arts and about Bruce. And she said to me, you and Bruce would have got along like a, you know, whatever, house on fire. <laughs> and that because of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, the first part of it about what's behind the fist, what causes conflict, she said that's what his real interest was. I really got caught up in the movies and all of that. He really wanted that to be explored and go beyond that, but unfortunately it didn't have time. So she said, I'm going to write, she wrote a forward in my, one of my books, uh, my, the children's books, martial art book, uh, and that a four and a half page four, which is beautiful. And I just, that was just meant so much to me. It, it was a great, a great honor. And not because I thought Bruce was on a pedestal. I thought it was a down to earth human being who himself in China, got bullied, and who himself in the United States got bullied, bullied because of inter, what they call interracial marriage. Um, that was very difficult for him and for Linda. So to me, that was a that was a very important time that when I met her and what I learned and what Linda came forward and told me about Bruce and what we were, and she really and uh, really and. Uh, liked what we did. And then they had a Bruce and Brandon Lee Memorial Banquet. So I went to them, and one of them was in San Francisco. And they gave out this medal, the Bruce the Dow Jao- Dao- Jao- Kundo medal. And she gave one to me, and then <laughs> this is really good. And then everybody went, well, okay, Dr. T, all right, you know. And then she said, Jean Webster Doyle, this is my wife. And everybody, who's this woman? What is she in the martial arts? <laughs> well, of course, she's my wife, and she were partners in this. You know, whatever I've written, whatever I've done, she's always been behind. So she came up and got a medal, too, and they're going, what? Who's this? But Linda goes, this is important. This is Gene, this is his wife, and this is his partner. So that was that was, that was very wonderful that, that with, with Linda. Wow. What, I can't think of much better of an honor than to have your, your – can I say life's work? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, this, this cause it is, is – clearly evokes so much passion for you, validated by, you know, sort of indirectly, but as direct as you could get, the most famous martial artist of our era. Yes. Yes. That's that's absolutely incredible. Yes. And a few weeks ago, we did an episode on Bruce Lee. We we do those periodically, diving into uh, the historical profile of a famous martial artist. And the first one we did was on Bruce Lee. And we talked a little bit about his history with being bullied and the fighting and all these things and watching that path. And one of the things that we speculated was what would his life have looked like had he lived longer? Because, of course, he died so young. Yes. But here we get a little bit of a glimpse of what that might have been. You're connecting some of those dots for us. So yes. that's really fantastic. Linda felt that way. He would have been my age, too. He would have been exactly 75. We were born the same year as, as Chuck Norris. Chuck and Bruce and I are the same age, Bruce being not alive anymore, obviously. Of course. Wow. Wow. What a, what a great story. That's Thank You me. didn't disappoint. <laughs> Thank you. So, of course, like just about everybody we've had on the show, your life has, has had martial arts through it almost entirely. But if you had to go back, you know, that, that, those occurrences that – had you stepping into a dojo for the first time, what if those hadn't happened or, or if you hadn't been bullied enough to push you over the threshold of wanting to train in the martial arts? What do you think your life would have looked like? Very superficial. I think very, excuse me, very superficial. I think it would just gone on with what everybody else does and, you know, made money or whatever I do, or whatever done. But the martial arts gave me such a focus I, I can't even tell you what it's like, what it does for me. I mean, it's something I live every single day because I write continually. And I, I talk to people continually. I was talking to a man in Colombia, South America, uh, this morning. We have these you know, Skype calls back and forth. And then the man up in Maine this morning, too, is on the martial artist. So 
this is something that really means a great deal to me. My life would have been just very empty, very unfocused. So I'm so extremely happy to have it. And it's a few friends along the way who really, really meant a big deal to me. And one, may I mention one right now? By all means, please. His his name is Sensei Danny Hakim. Danny Hakim was an Australian, and he went to uh, Israel. Um, and he he wanted to do something about the, the fighting between the Israelis and the Palestinian kids. I mean, he, he walked right into the war zone. Last time I talked to him on the phone, he said he was going from shelter to shelter because they were bombing. And last time he emailed me, and the Palestinians you know, were killing, knifing people all over the place. So this is real. The man is in a real martial art zone, if you want to call it. And he's used our programs there to great success. And he really felt them be very important. But what he did was was extremely important. It was so simple. And I'll just tell you, just take a second. He has two groups, Palestinians, Israeli kids, right? And so he has these kids out in the street. Most of them are at each other's throats, so to speak. And some of them are actually at each other's throats. So he creates this dojo, Shotokan, completely Shotokan, completely Japanese, and you and you you know, talk to each and each go, you know, all of the all of the things are all Japanese Japanese. It's a culture. He created a culture in the middle a Japanese culture in the middle of Israel. Okay? So the Israeli kids come in the door. Let's say there's one door on each side. They come in and then the Palestinians come in. Come in. They have their cultures. They've been conditioned into their cultures. Now when they come into the dojo and it's totally Japanese, they have to drop, at least temporarily, their old framework of their culture and embrace the new. Right? Mm-hmm. Both of them do. So what happened? And they're on, is it Budo for Peace? B-U-D-O. You want me to get, interview somebody? Boy, interview this man. <laughs> Budo for Peace in Israel. And now what I'm happened talking. was these kids could talk to each other. They would say on the, on the Internet, they, you can see them talking to each other. He's got some little videos. And they say, you know, on the outside in the street, I'd be want to kill you. But now I can talk to you in here. And so he created this kind of trick the brain, so to speak. I don't know how much he consciously did or not, but he got these kids to come in and become peaceful by embracing a new culture and not the old ones that were causing them to such hostility. And he used the martial arts for that. And I, it, he, to, he and I and a few other really feel the martial arts can deal not only with the bullying on the playground, but bullying on the battlefield, most definitely. That the bullying on the battlefield starts with bullying on the playground. It's in the recipient stages there, and then it, you know the factors that create that carry over. So that to me is vitally important. That man is doing a wonderful job. Wow! And as I was listening to you, it reminded me. I, I grew up in a small town in Maine, and uh, just a few miles down the street, there was a camp that operates in a very similar way called uh, Seeds of Peace. I know they that. bring together. Okay, you, yeah, so I grew up a few miles from Seeds of Peace oh. and for listeners that might not know they bring in Palestinian children and Israeli children and have them interact in a traditional American summer camp environment. Yes. With the hope that as they spend time together they realize that they are far more alike than different. Exactly. And, and using but they, that they, they use the martial arts to do right. that. Well, I think the martial art has a tremendous potential for helping children like that in war zones and so on. I, I would be shocked if it, if it didn't, you know, it does, <laughs> you know, it's certainly, um, this, I don't know if this is a one-off or if he's d- done this in multiple locations, but I, I would expect pretty much anywhere you could drop a program like that. It would be successful. Well, he's done in many locations throughout the Middle East. There and, oh, well. and, uh, so he's he's quite a man, Danny Hakim, Budo for peace. Yeah, let, uh, after the episode, let's talk. Maybe you can make an introduction. Sounds like someone we should have on the show. Oh yes. So the next story I want to I want to get into is talking about how the martial arts has helped you overcome or move through or however you want to think about that that path, some kind of low point, some challenge in your life, mm-hmm. and. You know, I'm going to guess it's around bullying, but it doesn't have to be. And just tell us about that. How did how did you move forward because of your martial arts experience? Well, that's interesting. There's bullying and there's bullying. There's bullying when somebody on the outside wants to attack you physically or mentally, emotionally. But then what happens a lot of times, what happened to me and what happens to most people, we take on the bullying and we bully ourselves. It goes internalizes. 
oh, I must be bad, I must be terrible, they're calling me these names, I must be, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we start bullying ourselves, and our, our self-esteem just goes right down the tubes, and we, we feel depressed, and that's what happened. I felt terribly depressed, and I just and I didn't know what to do. And I realized that one thing that could give me a sense of self-esteem was the martial arts. And also, what was really interesting was in the physical part of the martial arts, the kata, for me, the Japanese form, the kata, was yeah. very interesting in how that gave me a sense of self-esteem. What it did was when I really did it, and really did it fully, completely, that I lost myself into it. And what I did was allowed all that anger and fear that um, that I had inside myself to come out of the form in a safe and controlled way. And that's what I created for kids, a safe and controlled environment where they could exorcise, if one use that word, not exorcise, but exorcise those kind of demons of anger and fear and so on and so on, self-doubt, within the form. So when we did the form in that way, I, I, I did. I felt, oh, this is, feels good. And the kids did too. So I knew that, that the physical form, not the katas, were not just to practice self-defense forms when you get physically attacked, but had to do with your sense of, I can let this out and let it fully out, completely, utterly out in this form without hurting myself or hurting anybody else. And that sure felt good. It was like, you know, like screaming when you're really angry, I mean, really screaming, you know, but it did it within the form. It was beautiful. So I think yeah. that, that meant a lot to me. Yeah, and... As someone who gravitated far more towards doing kata as I was growing up in karate than than sparring for possibly different reasons, I, I can certainly empathize with that. Mm -hmm. You know, to to get out there and and scream bloody murder, <laughs> as one of my instructors used to <laughs> express it. Very good. So cool. So. Uh, I mean, you've already mentioned some pretty fantastic names of people that you've been around during your time in the martial arts. But if you had to pick the one that was the most influential, the strongest uh, supporter of your martial arts career, who would that be? Well, he's an actor, uh, David Carradine in Kung Fu. I thought Kung Fu show was extraordinary um, because here's a man who could fight. He could, you know... <laughs> put anybody out, so to speak. And there's so many situations in the Kung Fu series where he was attacked. For instance, a fellow in the bar, because he was Asian, they said, you know, you're just you're Chinese, China man, you know, you get out. And he just turned away from him. And, and the man pulls a knife, and he just does a kick. He kicks the knife, boom, the knife goes into the ceiling. And then he turns around, keeps drinking his water or something. He did all these things, although at times he did fight, but he would try, and most of the time, not to get into the physical part of it. And that, I thought, was a great, um, a good thing for martial artists to see, and anybody to see. There are other ways to get out of it. And, and he, was, he was, the story, obviously, he was falsely accused, or maybe, I don't know, about the death of that fellow he, he killed uh, uh, to protect himself back in China. So he was, the whole idea, he was moving, get moving and moving and moving. And my wife says, you know, you're, you're Kung Fu because hey, we keep moving around trying to find people to really want to do this kind of martial art. So, yes, David Carradine, as an actor, portraying the martial arts in that way, uh, and uh, really that his early part when he went in the martial arts school way in China, he just sat outside and wouldn't leave, and, they, and, the, and the, the instructor would come out and say, leave, you all leave, and he would never leave, and then they came in, and he said, they, this boy is dedicated. And the things he learned, I thought the things he learned at martial arts school were very, very interesting, from his called grasshopper and so on. So that, that to me was a very important part of my life. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, and, you know, this, and that show came out a little bit before my time, so... I don't remember quite the the context, oh. but I'm wondering if that was the first or one of the first martial arts portrayals where it wasn't all about the fighting. Yes, then? yes, it was. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't remember when it was out, but maybe in the '80s or something. Um, yes, it, that's that was the portrayal of the martial arts. That I think were very important to for people and I think they should bring that back at least the videos back we have the videos I will watch them once in a while just to 
just to enjoy it. And so, yeah, that's was, that was quite something. Yeah, and it's, what, what's striking me is is the contrast to the explanations, the Im- impressions that other guests that have been on the show, for, for example, John Graydon talking about his first exposure to martial arts movies, and not only that the fight scenes were exciting and flamboyant, but incredibly violent. And, and, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm reading his book right now, Who Killed Walt Bone? Really a fun book. Um, and just really talking about how strong of an impact that made on him, the, the unnecessary elements of the violence, and, and they were exciting, but here we've got kind of the another end of the spectrum where you're resonating with the avoidance of the violence. Yes. Yes, I don't like violence. I don't like to watch. I mean, I think as a younger when I was, you know, we had we had violence in the films and John Wayne was our hero at that point. I was young, you know. And uh but then I got the point this is I don't like watching this. It just it just doesn't resonate with me at all. So when when David Carradine came out with Kung Fu, I said, that's much more. And I don't like watch violence. I just can't see the sense of it. I mean, it gets the, there's a thrill, but it's very primitive, so to speak. And I just it just turns me off completely. Yeah, oh, I, by the way, I want to mention something, if sure. I may. Please. It was a, an incredible film, and I'm not sure it's in a major film, but it was called Secret of the Horse with Ernie Reyes Jr., Secret of the Horse. And uh, you can get it online. And it was a very, very interesting film about a young boy who went to this school and he got bullied. It's very funny because the bully in the movie was actually his brother in real life. But <laughs> but he was being, uh, you know, attacked or, or called names and you, know, you China boy and you know, all this kind of thing. And so there's only one scene where he kicked the guy, boom, and he knocked the fly on his butt. But then the head of the school was there. So they said, look, if you do this physical skills, you're out in the school. So you had to learn something. So the, throughout the film, and actually at the same time, and I, his father, Ernie Sr., and I had been conversing about the 12 ways to walk over with confidence in my books. And um, it's, so he comes out in the movie and starts using those 12 ways, walks away, uses humor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Avoided fights all the way through. Even when they said, okay, let's fight, and they started to have a fight, he physically, he, he did amazing. He, both of he and his brother, some amazing martial art techniques where Ernie ducked, dodged, blocked everything that his brother threw at him, or the bully threw at him. So throughout the whole thing, it was it was high it was high adventure, but it was not the typical thing. I'm going to go blow this guy away, so to speak. So, the Secret of the Horse with Ernie Reyes Jr. Great, great video. I'll check it out, and of course, we'll have it in the show notes. And for anybody that may new, be new to the show, we put all the links and video clips and all that stuff that we talk about in the shows over at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, of course, all one word, dot com. So you can check that out there. How about competition? Uh-huh. Yes. Is competition something that, that you ever jumped into? Once. <laughs> Once. Okay. In Madison Square Garden, 1966. I actually saw Bruce Lee there, too. He was doing his one-inch punch at a bone. I saw Bruce doing that. This was back in 66 or something. Around, around in, there. in New York City, Madison Square Garden, felt for him, right? Okay. Yeah. So they had this friend of mine named John McGee. He used to write for Black Belt Magazine. They called it the Bloodbath. Nobody knew anything at that point about tournaments. They were making it up as they were going along, like, oh, what should we do about this? What should we do? He kicked him, knocked him down. What should we do? You know. <laughs> so it was kind of like very uh, beginning. Everybody was kind of beginning. Anyway, it was a, it was a tournament part of it. There was a lot of demonstrations. Some of them were, ooh. <laughs> but anyhow, yes. And then, so anyhow, I, we were f- fighting, the Randuri, you know, Kumite. And anyhow, uh, I was winning, you know. And, and I, so, so then he threw a kick, and it got me. And I hurt myself, hurt my arm. And he kind of went one up on me. And then every time I kept forward, he would step out of the ring. And, you know, you're not supposed to do that. So every time I kept where you step out. But in those days, they didn't have any sense of, hey, this is not right. Get back in here and do it. And so he won. became the brown belt, uh, the head of the brown belt division. And I, I basically beat him. So and I hurt myself. I said, you know, I don't think I want to do this. It just doesn't feel good. And, you know, I mean, and Chuck Norris was there. And I'm, I've seen other ones um, that people were there. And I think Chuck was more of an athlete. Then it, I didn't see violence. I thought he was a very good athlete. 
he would sit down in his mind, figure out what I should do, and imagine it, and so on. Um, so, but you know, I'm not, I'm not. I wasn't athletic in that way. Um, I didn't. That just didn't stand out to me. So I said, I've got to do something other than this. And obviously, I went off into what I did, writing the books and thing about martial arts and so on, and um, for children especially. When did you write your first book? Oh gosh, I wrote my first book. Uh, Karate, the Art of Empty Self. I wrote that in 1980, let's see, 80, no, 1982, whatever it was. And that was amazing. I, I thought, here's a very simple book, Karate, the Art of Empty Self. And uh, I, I got it published, and I figured, okay. And it just hit people. It just, it, they just said, Wow. And I got people calling me or sending me emails. They love this book. They said this and that. A lot of people did that. And so I entered it into the Benjamin Franklin Awards. It's for independent publishers. And I figured, oh, well, let's take a look at it. And let's see what happens. So anyhow, that when I wrote the book, so we went to this big event, this big convention where they had the bo- uh, books being awarded and so on. And I remember sitting at the table with these people, and then my award was one of the books. And all the table was nice. Come on, karate, you have yourself karate. You know, go ahead. it's kind of cheering for me. And the winner is, you know, gold medal, karate, the art of yourself in new age, the category of new age. So that that book uh, it made a big difference. It made a difference. So I remember a man in, in Switzerland read that and traveled all the way to California to see me because of that book. It was just simple little book, little vignettes, page after page after page. But it got a, it got a lot of awards and acclaims. And so I was very happy. And that was in 82, and I just, it led to another one and another one, and then, you know, it just kept going. It just opened the box, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, that was the first one. That was, that was a good one. It sounds like that book has a special place in your heart. Oh, yeah. Is it because it was the first one, or it sounds like it launched a good chunk of your career? It did. It did. It really took the essence of what I was feeling about the martial arts. I didn't know if it would be popular because it wasn't physical technique. It wasn't anything like that. It was more the philosophy of the martial arts. But actually, not made up, although I'd read books in the martial art world, the Tao Ji Kune Do, and you know, various Asian books. But this was from my own observation, just directly from my own observation, what the martial arts, I felt really the significance it had. So... That meant a lot to me. And there were just little the vignettes, just a little few paragraphs per, per page. It wasn't this like big. I didn't want people to memorize and make this their authority in any way. I wanted them to take these little vignettes and think about it and then go, look, is this true? Is what this vignette, this little, this part of this page, what the, the, the author is saying, Dr. T, is this true? Let me look. Let me find out for myself. Not memorize a bunch of information and become some kind of authority because I've memorized all this, but no, to actually look and see is what is being said is accurate and, and, and what effect it has on their lives. So it was very different than just putting out a lot of knowledge for them to memorize. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of us that started training in the 80s, for me, the book that I always remember is Zen and the Martial Arts which has come up a few times. I don't know if you've ever read that. but that book, sorry, say it again. Zen and the Martial Arts. Oh, yes, of course. Joe Hyatt, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, just a, a great book. Lots of, it reminded me of, of that as you were describing it, just yes. the short pieces. So. Well, it's not like, I'm my books, and I'm not trying to put myself out there as being important or anything. I'm not. No, no, that they're different. They're very different than Joe's. Joe's book was really uh, more the, the Zen basis of martial arts, which is important to understand, true, definitely. Well, you're certainly important, because you're here right now, and he's not, so. Oh. oh. <laughs> we, we can lift you up all we want. Uh-oh, all okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if there's somebody that you could train with, and, and we'll even op- open it up, living or dead, who would you, who would you want to hang out with and maybe share some kicks? That's a very interesting question. Who in the martial arts world would I... Well, there are obviously a lot of people. I think that Denny Hakim in Israel was somebody I'd like to work with because he's working with children in a real martial situation, real, not just some dojo or dojang down the corner, Joe's, you know, whatever it is, but he's having to make his martial arts skills very, very real, physical skills and mental. He realized 
that using our program as a mental part of the martial arts, he, these kids could not start physically fighting. Somebody pull out a gun, bang, they're gone. Or they'd stab them. And they, you know, they would kill them right away. And not, and most people, the martial artists, I say, some people I used to say this, I don't say it now. So if you really want to do self-defense, get yourself a trained Doberman Pinscher and a 457 Magnum. And then you can <laughs> deal with the bully, you know, right? And of course, I was just kind of joking. But in his situation in Israel, you can't just say, okay, hey, and get into your stance and go to, and they just pull out a gun and boom. And so he had to teach these kids the mental martial arts, which, are, which I was doing. And so he did that. Here, now, here he's sitting in this amazing, dangerous zone, going right ahead. Nothing is stopping him. And he's saying, Dr. T, your programs are doing great. And, and of course, he has to have, this is very important. I'm not saying the physical martial arts are not important. They're absolutely important. In this way, in the martial arts, the physical martial arts gives you the confidence to use the mental part. Because you could always figure if it fell back and you couldn't use them, you've got some really strong physical skills. So the stronger and better than your physical martial arts skills, the better you'll be able to, more capable you'll be able to, the mental part. So two work together so very well. So Danny is a person I would work with. I don't feel like I want to go to Israel. That's a little bit dangerous, but, you know, he's, he's yeah. incredible. Yeah, that, and that falls right in line with, with what I would have expected for you mm. for an answer. I mean, we definitely have a, a theme, as we usually do, and, and it's great. So we, we mentioned one movie, Secret of the Horse. Is that your favorite? Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Favorite movie? Yeah. Well, just as I say, I think that The Karate Kid was a very good movie, too. Um, that made a lot. The, the first one. And although they got went on, I thought the last one was a, it's a very, you know, very glorious type of film. But it was based on the original film. Jackie Chan played the actual character. I mean, almost verbatim is in the first film, which was good. Um, and but I, I that's where, you know, I, I, I did enjoy the physical skills when the young boy, you know, in Karate Kid was being attacked by those guys and his instructor comes over and, you know, you know, knocks him out, so to speak. You know, that 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 made sense because he was defending the boy. So I mean that was a that, that boy would have really been hurt if that if all those boys really went and beat him up. So that that physical part was okay, but I think the Karate Kid meant a lot to me back then, and uh, I think it meant a lot to people. Change again, it started pushing the martial arts in another direction, away from the very violent martial art movies, which, you know, I think that Linda Lee Cadwell, I think, and Bruce Lee, I think they really wanted to change out of that. They wanted to create something more and say, but Bruce didn't make it, so to speak. But he, he wanted to. So I think that that film, Karate Kid, meant a lot to me. I think it hopefully it meant a lot to other people. Change the view of the martial arts away from that very, very violent image. Absolutely. And that movie comes up often on the show, and mm -hmm. certainly for its impact, not just on people that were in the martial arts, but people that were not in the martial arts. It was the one of the first martial arts movies that was appropriate for not only broad ages, but broad audiences. I mean, yes. pretty much anybody could relate to that movie and just the, the legions of children that started training in the martial arts. And, and I was one of them, mm. you know, that movie had an influence in, in bringing me in. I mean, it was just a, a hair ahead of it, but you know, I was still part of that karate kid generation mm -hmm. of people that trained in the martial arts. Have there been any other movies that seem to have that sort of approach for you, I, we, we've got two of them. Can we round it out with a third? Doctor T recommended martial arts films. I have to go back to one, and I'm going to say it again, if you don't mind, because I, I don't watch many martial art movies. I just didn't, because I thought they were awfully violent. Um, and I can't think of any other than this one that Ernie Reyes Jr. did, The Secret of the Horse, and what that meant to me, and what that meant, I think, in the martial arts. And I, it, interesting, because what, the way I first saw it was the EFC, Educational Funding Company. They did uh, conventions a while back. I don't think they do them anymore, though. Um, and they showed that film. And uh, I got tears in my eyes, that's strange enough. And I came out and I saw his father, Ernie Sr., and I said, and I looked, I had a book that I had written that showed a young boy 
in a position like the same boy that Ernie uh, Jr. represented in the film, and he was being but beaten up so badly, but then he gets out of it in in, in more intelligent and in nonviolent ways. So I, I just happened to see, I happened to have the book with me, and I talked to his father. I said, "Look at this!" And he went, "Wow! It, it just you two are right in line with this." So that meant a lot to me. I mean, I watch movies. I watch other movies, kung fu type and karate type of things. But I want the ones that really mean something to me, like Karate Kid, like the other one, the Kung Fu. I think that Ernie Jr.'s, Ernie Jr., uh, his film, that Secret of the Horse, really meant something because here's a man in that film, and he has a, he has a dream too, where he's really pounding on this bully. He just you know, really want lets it out, but he doesn't. And that he has some wonderful physical skills, amazing physical skills, and and just avoids it every way possible. And at the end, I won't tell you the end because the end is nice. <laughs> you can find it <laughs> online. Secret of the Horse. So I would say going back to that because I've watched many films, but they don't stand out to me as something that has meaning beyond just punch, kick, strike. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. And that's important. I mean, there are a lot of movies that. You know, are fun to watch once, right? But there aren't a lot of movies that are fun to watch, even when you know what's going to happen. And certainly, The Karate Kid is one of those for for me, and sounds like for you, and and I suspect a good number of the people listening right now. Yes. So, how about actors? I mean, if we open it up a little bit more, are there are there any martial arts actors that you think really do a good jo- do a good job? Well, again, yeah, I have episodes? to go back to the ones I've just mentioned. I don't want to re- be repetitive. No, no, Ernie no, no. Reyes Jr., you know, the fellow who played in the Karate Kid. Like, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. But, Ralph uh, Macchio. So, what's his name? Ralph Ralph Macchio. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, of course. And his instructor, too, was very good. Um, and David Carradine. I think as an actor, I would take David Carradine. He was, he, Bruce Lee apparently applied for that role, and they didn't take him. Maybe he was too Asian or something, very, you know, prejudicial. But, Carradine got it. He looks kind of Asian, if you know what I mean. But his acting, I thought, was superb. You know, he could bring out emotions in his acting subtly, just very subtly, by looking at the guy, the bullies come up in the bar, for instance, and he just has this look. He just kind of turns and looks at the guy like, oh, yeah, go ahead, try it, buddy, and see how far you're going to get. But he can see that, and he doesn't do it. And then he, he does something else where he steps out of the way or he does certain things that are martial arts, physical skills, but that makes the bully look like an idiot. You know, bully falls, falls on the floor or whatever he does. So I thought David Carradine as an actor um, really portrayed the martial arts in a very holistic way. He the subtlety of being able to deal with the, the villain in a way that made you laugh and just made you like, go, get yeah, great. And then part of you, though, I hate to admit, go for it, get him. You know, yeah, there's that part of you goes, yeah, well, you know. But who didn't? And it meant you felt better. You're like, good. No, I'm glad he didn't do that because there's too many of this violence. So I would really stick, if I may, with, uh, and I know I re- I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important that David Carradine with Kung Fu, people should get that. Even if they have, maybe it was a while ago, but r- look at those episodes. One of the early ones when he's in the monastery, oh my goodness, and the, what they taught him and what the uh, instructors taught them there was very intelligent. It wasn't just simple Hollywood stuff. There's a reason that some shows like Kung Fu have been in syndication globally for as long as they have. Mm-hmm. There's there's something that they bring that a lot of modern shows don't. So I don't think there's anything wrong with going back to choose him or, or the movies that you've, you've chosen by any means. Well, I, I, if I may, I wanted to uh, just put this in here. I'm not sure if it's appropriate at this point. Um, Martial arts, because you ask about martial arts in the future and so on. May I interject this at this point? By all means. Um, I, I think the evolution of the martial arts, it kept, for me, it kept going, it kept going. I said, why were they so bullied in that one town in New York? Why were they after me, you know? And then the next town, why, the, what, what did I do? I didn't do, well, I, I found out it was very primitive, very almost like animals after me. Like, like, I was the big guy, and they, they were going to get me, and they got me down. It was very primitive. So I said, my God, it's just this kind of an animalistic right here that, this, that's driving people to, to bully. And so I kept going and going and going. And then this is, this is a little bit 
well, this is very important, but it may not be what most people would think of the martial arts. There was a study done at the University of British Columbia and a Center for Infant Cognition. Now, this was a very, very interesting. I'm interested in bullying. So why are these, it feels like they're just automatic. These kids are just doing it. It's like this instinct, boom, instinct. So anyhow, this in this um, in the study that they did, which is called, this is a kind of a fancy word, but it isn't. Empirical observation means firsthand, looking at it firsthand. You're standing there looking at it, what's happening, and you see what's happening based on your observation. Very simple. Yep. So they took yep. these little infants, nine months to 11 months, and the mothers had them on their laps. And this is on our webpage, martialartsforpeace.com. It's on our webpage. Anyhow, they, these little, they would did these little teddy bears. And they had these two teddy bears, one who did certain things that the little baby seemed to like. They seemed to gravitate to us. And the other one, they did the puppet, uh, the little pup, uh, teddy bear, did something that was not like about the, from these nine to 11 months, month old kids. And they figured out, I won't go into it too much, they figured out that children, all human beings, are born with what they call social stratification. In other words, my group versus your group. In other words, we're born to be a bully. It's in our genes. Genetically, we have this. It's like a hard drive in the brain that this, this hard drive says you have to protect yourself and your own group, your own tribe or whatever. It's very, very ancient, but it's still in there. And so what we do is we're really genetically, you know, DNA, hardwired to fight. And that's the fight or flight system, you know, and that's okay. It's in there. And I say to the kids, you know, I do a little exercise with the kids. You stand over there 20 feet away, and I'll walk towards it. When it feels uncomfortable, tell me to stop. And they go, stop. Usually an arm length and a half, so I stop. And that feels okay. They feel a little nervous. So I step back. How do you feel? Fine. So I take a little further step forward right into their face. So like, Whoa, they all get very, very... You know, the eyes get open and they start, you know, like preparing to fight. And so I said, look, at that is your bully brain. That bully brain is actually your buddy. I'm just kids I'm talking to. They, that bully brain wants to protect you. Here I'm coming towards it, wants to protect you. This is good. This is not bad. Bullying is not bad unless it gets carried away and keeps doing and keeps hurting. I said, all the bully wants is some more alternatives than just fight or flight. It wants to learn to do other things to get out of this conflict. Like, maybe I could talk the way out. Maybe I could walk away. Maybe I can call authority. Maybe, I, you know, the 12 ways to walk away. The I could use all of that. The bully brain wants that. But the bully brain is the bully brain, and we are born according to this study. And, and the study is firsthand, right? So you can't really argue with that. That we are born bullies, so to speak. We are born with Social, my group, social certification, my group's higher than yours or whatever. Now, that could lead to very serious consequences called ethnocentrism. Now, this my group is better than your group, and I'm, you know, that's what the war is about. So it, it's in our brain. It's basically structurally in our DNA, that primitive brain, the, the reptilian brain, way in the back, you know, the three parts of the brain, way in the back, that we're actually hardwired for war, if you want to use that. So that's what they're dealing with, our friends in uh, Israel, looking in this and saying, yes, this is so. So we have to look at the bully in a totally different way now. We have to look at the martial arts as a means, an actual means to deal with this bullying in this new and important new view, this insight that's come along to say We've got to take this bullying and treat it a whole different ways and start giving the person, the young person in the class, more alternatives to deal with the bully. But don't judge the bully. The bully is there to protect you. Does this make sense? It it does. Good. It does, yeah. Uh, I, I think the one thing that I would play a little bit of devil's advocate because part of my role here on the show is to think about what some of the listeners Good. Good. may want to ask for questions. So if it's innate, isn't is there ever a sense of, of futility on your part, feeling like you're, you're banging your head against a wall? Absolutely. I think that's what most people feel, that it is futile. It's just hopeless. We can't deal with this violence. We just can't because, it's, because they feel it's inbred in them. They can feel this tendency in themselves. Each of us can feel it in certain circumstances. Everybody feels this way. Um, let me just take a little, little, little story. 
if, and this is why everybody feels this way, it's really important. If you're on a playground, you're on a playground with a group of kids, and you're talking, blah, 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 and all of a sudden you look to the side, and here comes Joe. Now, for an hour second, you may say, Joe, oh, Joe, the bully. So you recognize it. You have a recognition that this guy coming across the playground is a bully, and that has this, that's the image. There's Joe, the bully, is an image in your brain. That image, like domino effect, creates fear, and that goes to the freeze, fight, or flight. And these basic three parts of the brain, like almost like an automobile engine, they are computer. They work all the same structurally, anatomically. The brain is the same for all human beings on this planet. Our content is different. My bully may be different than your bully, and so on and so on. Uh, on the playground or racially and you know globally and so on, the Russians or this or that, whatever. And that matter of fact, I'm very much involved with helping Russian people to deal with this too. That's another story. But this bully brain is exactly anatomical. See that. First of all, we have to see that. We're all the same in that way. And therefore, it's not we have to say, you're at fault, you're the flame, you're the terrorist, we're the free, you know. No, hey, whoa, we all have this situation that we're all conditioned in this way. Let's look at that. Let's all take time to all of us at the time to get together and have a dialogue and look at this thing, talk about this thing, and see what you can do in a martial arts school, because I know the martial arts school can, if recognizing the importance of this, can create an environment that will bring this bully brain into a, a place where it's recognized, but it's put in its proper place, and it's given alternatives to deal with the violence. So yes, you can feel very frustrated, you feel very you know, depressed if you don't know what's going on, if you just feel this impulse and don't know what to do. But there's something that one can do with them. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And that's great. And it's going to take a lot of effort. You know, certainly I, I'm, I, I would feel if, if, I, if I was in your shoes, you know, doing this work and then finding out that genetics are actually against what I believe to be is right. I, I would feel like it's going to take that much more effort. Well, that's you know, not interesting. Oh, sorry. Wrong. No, no, no. But genetics yeah. is not against. Genetics is just what is. Okay. The bully is what is. It's not bad or good or anything. It's just a fact uh, at our situation. It's just like part of our brain does other things. We, we have memorization in the brain. We have different parts of the brain. We do different things. It's just, like a machine. The, the, the being is okay. like a machine. But this... The thing about this hard drive that's in the brain, this DNA, you know, sense of that we're bullies, born bullies, is just a fact. That's all. But people think, oh, my God, what should I do about that? Well, the, you know, the fact is that you can do something, first by, as I said, by recognizing, and then, two, creating an environment where you can make more intelligent choices in the situations that would come up against you when people are trying to bully you and so on. So I think that even though we are, in a sense, driven in this one way, let me, well, let me give you a little quick thing. It is another word with an E. You know, this is called epigenetics. All it means is the, the gene, that bully gene, you want to call it the warrior gene, can actually not be changed. It does what it does. And, and you give an example. Riding a horse. You get on a horse, and if you just sit there and do nothing, the horse will do what it what does. It has its own sense of what it wants to do, genetic and everything else. Just what it's learned and everything will go and do what it's doing. But you're the rider, so you take the reins. Say, uh-uh, uh-uh, and you're sitting on the horse. Now, epi means on top. So the this, this thing on top of the gene, you can, if you look at the genetic structure, if you look at that violence in yourself, and it just it's nothing fancy. All these words sound like it's fancy. It really isn't. Just to sit there and, and feel and observe this, this impulse to fight. And, and in situations that may not even call for it, you can observe this thing. That observation, just observing it, that's what we're talking about. That's like the rider on the horse. When you observe it, when you look at it, it doesn't have to go in the direction that's supposedly intended. You can alter that warrior gene. You can make it, so you're creating, a, you're creating the right environment. It does not bring about that, genetic structure in a very destructive way that it was intended to do. 
but it wasn't, it, again, it wasn't intended to be destroyed. It was intended to protect us. And a very primitive brain, long, long time ago. It was very simplistic, you know, like the movie 2001. I don't want to get into that, but it was very, very <laughs> primitive. And you had to be in your tribe to survive, and you had to make sure that your tribe was the only one that could survive. And just one quick thing is that in a Disney film, there was these groups of apes. There's two groups on this island, or wherever it was. And at one time during the year, this, this section of the woods where they were in, would, all these fruits would come out, and so on and so on. So the two groups instinctually knew that they would go towards each other. Now, of course, do you think there was plenty of fruit for everybody? you think, hey, let's just share this? No. They were at each other's throats, pounding their chest, screaming, yelling, fighting each other. Well, wait a minute, what's going on? Because inside them, genetically, when was this hard drive that says, my group has to win, has to win over your group, has to. Now, they were very primitive, obviously, and they're not about to change that. The only way they can change is one group wiped out the other one. And that happens in war. You say, this group is bad, they should not live, get rid of them. It happens for centuries in various ethnicities and so on. I think the Jews have suffered more than anybody in history have suffered that, that, that they were bad, that they were the wrong, we've got to get rid of them. And that's terrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's hideous. But, but it comes from a very basic primitive sense of what the brain does at that reptile brain part. But, again, and we're in, we can bring about intelligence, human beings. Unfortunately, we can also think about the enemy and think of, oh, oh and think of all kinds of things about the enemy. That makes it worse. But we, there's intelligence in ourselves that can say, this is not right. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm feeling right towards this person right now. And just one quick thing. To me, it changed my life. This is the thing that changed my life right now, was I was raised as a young man to think the Russians were coming, and there was the air raid drills in the 1940s. And they rang the bell, and I would duck underneath the desk. The Russians are coming. They're going to bomb the atomic bomb. That's, you know. So years later... In a town in California, Sebastopol, strange sister city from Russia. The Russians go to come and do a sister city thing. And I was, oh my God, Russia, oh, what am I going to do? So, you know, I'm thinking they'd come in, look at them, oh, don't, don't, doing the kick and the hats and all the big Russian things. <laughs> so they came in, look at just like us. But wow. So I'm kind of nervous. I'm walking around the background. And I'm talking to this woman. I said, yeah, well, where are you from? She said, I'm from Georgia. I didn't hear a southern accent. I said, oh, Georgia. Now, later on, I found George in Russia. So she said at one point in the conversation, we from Russia. And I said, what? We from Russia? I'm a Russian. I tell you, I went into a fight or flight as mm -hmm. if you were holding a gun to my head because of the conditioned image I had in my brain that she was my enemy. It had been just like Pavlov's dog. Year after year, month after whatever it is, all those years, Russia would come. So when I saw her, just the image triggered that fight or flight as if it was real, where it wasn't. She was a nice lady. So I go, my God, is this, what is this doing to the brain? What's happening with the brain that's doing this? And where can I talk about this? Where can I bring this out and talk about this? Is this happening to all of us? Our images that we have of, the, of other people, the, quote, enemy, that's built into our brain, causing this kind of violence? So I think the only place I could figure was the martial art world, because it's martial. This whole thing is martial art. All of this was creates this kind of conflict. So I hope this makes us uh, understanding, but it changed my life saying, my God, are all human brains doing this? And yes, all human brains work exactly the same. The concept may not be in Russian, it may have been somebody else that we thought was our enemy, but it's exactly the same thing in the brain and all of us. So we got to look at it. We got to say, my God, look at this thing. Does this make sense? It makes all kinds of sense. And, Good. And thank you. Certainly there's, oh, no, thank you. I appreciate you sharing this. And, you know, certainly you're working from a much broader body of knowledge on this than I have and probably most of the listeners have, but I think you've done a really good job breaking it down and, and giving us the high points, the important stuff. But I'm wondering, in our modern climate here in America with our strained relations with folks of the the Islamic yes. faith, do you see any correlation with what you experienced coming you know, around the Cold War? Yes, I think it's basically to say it's the same. No matter who your enemy is, it's the same. Uh, some enemies are pretty horrific. I mean, they're, they're so identified with their ethnocentric belief systems. They're so identified with it that if anybody 
threatens them, they, they say they're going to die. So they, they have to, they defend themselves in pretty horrific ways. I mean, every war is horrific. You know, you can't really choose one over the other. Yes, I think it's the same situation it's always been. The human beings are caught in this dilemma of being driven by this hardwired for war. And by the way, this isn't as difficult as it may seem. Maybe because it's new, people say, wow, that's difficult. No, it's not. All one can, has to do is observe themselves every day. Just, just, just watch what's happening when you look at a different person. Oh, that's right. Oh, you certainly feel that. Oh, look at that. All is just watch what's going on in ourselves each and every moment. But it is related to what's going on in the Middle East, most definitely. But if you look at through history, there's no difference. You know, back, whatever. All they're doing the same thing, that the brain, being hardwired, says I've got to be in control, that everybody outside my group is a threat to it, et cetera, et cetera. That's all it is, and it's very, very simple. And the, the thing that actually can deal with it is just to observe it. The actual act of the observation of that impulse can nullify it in the moment. And you only can do it in the moment. You can't say, well, I'm going to go get a Ph.D. 10 years from now, I'll figure this out, study anthropology, sociology. No. It has nothing to do with thought in that way. Thought can't create a solution to thought, the problems thought has created. Thought is what's happening that divides us. I have an image of you. That's thought. You have an image of me. That's thought. So it's thought that's causing the conflict coming from the biological brain that says you better stay in your group and you better protect yourself because the other, whoever the other may be, is a threat to you. So it's very structurally, very simple, and one can see it in themselves. And again, it's not knowledge that's going to bring a, you know, it's not a problem to be solved. It's a reality to actually being experienced in the moment, to observe that in oneself in the moment when one sees somebody that all of a sudden feels a threat to them. Look at this. Where is this coming from? It did not react out of it, not get freaked out, not judge it, just to see it. Oh, wow, look at that. That's interesting. And that, that can nullify it. That intelligence that says just, oh, I see what's going on. I'm not going to act out of this. It's, it's stupid. And that, that ends it. But people say, oh, no, you have to study. You have to get 10 PhDs or study. You know, every intro course, introduction course, to peace education, any college now says you have to study anthropology, sociology, political science, history, psychology, and so on and so on and so on. I say, no, that's all thought. It has nothing. You can't do it that way. Any, I don't want to go into this too much. It's very simple, actually, just to observe oneself in the moment and to see those kind of reactions coming from that old brain. This is great stuff. Thank you. But And, and I'm sure we could sit and... and have hours of conversation and I would love to do so. And I, I don't know if you would love to do so, but I'm, I know you have the, the background, the context to do so probably give a day long lecture. If we well, asked you to, if person wants to, again, we're non nonprofit. So we're not, we, all our books on our webpage are free. We were given very generous donations to forward th for by forward thinking, um, individuals who had finances to do that. So all the books are on there free. It's martialartsforpeace.com, martialartsforpeace.com. Go on there, take a look at it, and see what's being said there. And see, there's a wonderful thing about Linda's part of her quote. Uh, it's on there, too, in my book, and so on. Um, and all the books are there free. You can download them. The curriculums, the teacher kids, we ask them people to contact us on that. But it's all there for anybody that wants it. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly we've given a ton of context about your mission. But take a minute, tell folks a little bit more about what those resources are, what's out there for parents or martial arts instructors. What can they expect to find that they'll benefit from? I think that the books, I wrote the first major book on bullying called Why Is Everybody Always Picking on Me? It like the song, Charlie Brown, Why Is Everybody? Yeah. And that goes back a bit. So I, I wrote that. I said, book on bullying. So I said, well, those are good. Pick it on me. Then I started thinking, well, Hmm, there's picking on us. There's group bullying. Okay, so I wrote, why is everybody picking on us? And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm also picking on myself. <laughs> so I said, why am I always picking on myself? So it goes and goes and goes. So on our webpage, you can see there's a there's quite a few books and quite a few. Then I realized you can't just talk about this like you and I just talk about it. If you really have got to educate young people, so you have to have means by which the teacher can educate the young person, not only the book, but a curriculum so they can read it 
and teach the children. Like Wise is picking on me, has a curriculum and a workbook. The kids can have a workbook too, so they can write in it and so on. So I'm really taking the martial arts into the school, so to speak, into the classroom, and have those kind of books, curriculums, workbooks, programs. Um, Maya Martial Art Industry Association, you know, for Century Martial Arts, um, did two programs of mine, the Bully Buster System and uh, the Character for Kids Kids, and they sold lots of those. So, again, I wanted to create those type of materials that martial arts instructors could use them, and believe me, it really helps to bring parents into the school. They want their children to deal with bullying in, in, in creative ways. And when they see this type of program, they'll choose them over somebody who just does punch, kick, punch, kick. I'm not putting that down, believe me. But they'll choose these type of skills for their children. So I highly recommend that. And again, they're there for anybody to use at any time. It's wonderful. And it's a fantastic contribution back again to the martial arts community, to the wider community on a subject that is so resonant for so many people right now. If, if anybody is on Facebook, they see, you know, the discussions, the the passionate discussions going on around the subject. So I think it's really appropriate that we have you on today. Well, thank you. We just tried to create the resources they can do something about it with. That's great. We're going to have links to everything that you talked about, the various books and the movies and all that over at the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But before we go, do you have any parting advice for the people listening? Yes, I do. The martial arts make it your life, completely your life. And don't do anything but martial arts in the way that we're talking about now. Because the martial arts can really deal with helping this tremendous violence in the world. I have a picture of a girl taped to my wall, and she's maybe about 11 years old, and she's looking so sad. She has a, a string of bullets across her chest. She's in war. And I look at that girl, and I say, I can help that child. I can really help that child, and I have. I've helped children all over the world. And that, I tell you, it keeps me going. I'm 75 years old, and I feel like I'm 15. I've got tremendous energy, and I want to do because I know what we do helps children deal with this violence. I, in Liberia, we worked for eight years with children of war in Liberia, and had tremendous success. I don't like success, but a tremendous response. So do it. Do the martial arts and see what, what I'm saying. I, don't take it as I'm this authority, but see if it's true or not. Look at the possibility. Can the martial arts really address conflict in this more intense battleground sense, if you know what I mean. Look at that. Just find out. Keep pushing. Keep asking questions. Keep trying to find And make it your whole life. Make it your complete whole life. Thanks for listening to Episode 53 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Dr. T for sharing with us. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about today, including information on the books Dr. T has written, as well as all of the other free resources from Martial Arts for Peace. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of our apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we do. Go ahead, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And remember the products we make at Whistlekick, like our great zip-up hooded sweatshirts, those and everything else we make are at whistlekick.com. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.